Uh, we're going to jump into the word this morning. And this, today we're talking about a series or part number two of our series called Underdogs. And uh, underdogs, last week, we really looked at the reality of how God is drawn to the least of us. Someone say least. least. He's not impressed with the one that knows everything. The one that tries to impress everyone around them with how deeply they love God and how long they prayed and how much they fasted. God's not interested in someone that says those things for the sake of them. Rather, what God is looking for is the person that knows I am zip without God. I'm nothing without him. Even when God went to selecting his own people, he wasn't looking for the strongest people. He wasn't looking for the bravest. It says it like this in Deuteronomy 7, in verse 7. It said, the Lord didn't pick Israel. He didn't set his love on you, nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. The qualification to, to being used by God is not because you're richer, more handsome, uh, faster, more knowledgeable, you went to school longer. Those are not the qualifications that God looks at. He said, for you were the least of all people. You were the very least. And we watch the life of Paul and we see Paul kind of going through that same system where he understands early on that, that he's, he, you know, he's, he calls himself a Jew of the Jews. Uh, he was a part of the Sanhedrin, the, the 70 men that kind of set the, the, the Supreme Court of Jerusalem back in that day. He was a brilliant uh, man, a, a, a psychologist in his own right. He, he understood philosophy and, man, he was amazing. But as you watch his ministry, slowly he realizes, man, none of those things really matter. Th those things may make me look important to people, but God isn't looking for somebody with all this knowledge. And slowly he talks about, I'm the least of the apostles. A little while later in his ministry, he says, I'm the least of the saints. And then finally, at the end of his ministry, he says, I'm the least of the sinners. In other words, my qualifications, who cares? Who gives a rip? It flies in the face of how we live our life. We live our life naturally and we want the strong behind us, right? Like whenever, this is why Alabama, the state loves football because we got two of the best teams in the country that go at it every single year. Anybody excited about football kickoff coming up? Come on, how many, how many roll tied in the house? I'm curious. How about some War Eagle? Let me hear it. Yes, see it's strong, it's strong in us. The force is strong in this place. We like to cheer for the, the winners and it's a beautiful season for our state because we have some winning moments happening right now. When it comes to uh, picking, picking us up in, in life, we, we call on the people that are stronger. If you have financial troubles, you're looking for somebody that doesn't, somebody that's better than you. If, you, if you're sick, what do you do? You go find a doctor who, who knows more about getting you unsick, right? If you broke a bone, hey, how do I fix this thing? You go to people that are stronger. When it comes to, let's say, buying trucks in America, we want trucks that are, that are tough, we want, we want a truck that's going to pull us out the ditch. And it doesn't matter if it's raining or snow. We, do, we want to go in the ditch just to ride out of it. That's the kind of truck we want. Something that can get us out of anything, right? When, when I was growing up, I'm a, a product of the 80s. And so I was born in 1974. That makes me 43 years old. And uh, 80 is one of the best decades for, for, for life, period. <laughs> because we were start, technology was kind of starting and music kind of shifted from the 70s and this and, and and guitar sounds were invented and hair hair was wild and crazy and tv was color and there were all this all this cool stuff was happening and uh and so i remember growing up there was this this truck commercial and there was this lady and every time i hear her, i thought that's that sounds terrible but she would always say she'd say don't you buy no ugly truck was that just where I grew up? Did, has anybody else ever heard that? Don't you buy no ugly truck. And I thought, I'm not ever buying your truck. Because it's not, it's not masculine. It doesn't feel strong when someone says it like that. And so we figured that out. And so today, whenever you watch a good truck commercial, the guy always has this grumble, gravelly voice. It's the beef guy. The beef, it's what's for supper. And whenever he talks about trucks, he talks about Horsepower and payload, <laughs> towing capacity, a Hemi engine, Bort, 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 built for tough. 
You know, that's what we want. That, that kind of voice right there, I can follow that guy anywhere. Everything's happy. Boy, go get me some daisies. I'm gonna do it, okay. Doesn't matter what he says, when it's gravelly, when it's strong, you know, that's what draws us to those things. But here's, here's what we know, is that God doesn't look at the same measurables that you and I look for strength, isn't that right? Uh, when Saul was named king of Israel, Saul was the very first king that Israel ever had. And before him, God's best for, for Israel was for them to be a theocratic nation, that, that God would rule them. And through the, the process of prophets uh, hearing from God and communicating the message of God to the camp, that was what God desired. But Israel wanted to be like everybody else. And they saw these nations that were strong and they were like, God, we want a king just like all of our enemies and the people around us. We wanna be like them. And so God let them have their own way. You understand that just because something happens doesn't always mean that God's hand is in it, right? What we do know, however, is that even when we make choices, God will back us as we go. So even when I make a wrong decision, I can have confidence that my God can make it up to me. Don't get too caught up in your bad choice. Just because things haven't turned out as good as you wanted them to, I know the nature of my God and his nature is to bring a blessing out of that curse. That's how he operates. And so for you to put this, this layer of perfection that I, if I ever miss it, God's done with me, it's just not the, the, the way our God works on this planet. And so Israel chose a king and God said, okay, a king you shall have. Saul ruled and he started off really good, but then there came a time where Saul disqualified himself from leading Israel. And so Samuel was the prophet at that time. And Samuel was a bad dude. Samuel went to Saul and Saul had saved some sacrifices. God had said, you know, you, I want you to overtake this land and kill everything in the land because it's all against me. Even the animals kill everything. And, and Saul didn't do it. He kept some things back. Samuel heard about it. There was a king of that nation that Saul had allowed to live. And Samuel, the Bible says, Samuel, actually the prophet, this older man came and he sliced this man to bits with a sword. That's kind of the, that's the prophet of God working right there. Y'all wanting to go find a prophet? I don't know if I'd be so hasty. And so, so, pro, so the prophet comes to Saul and he says, Saul, you disqualified yourself. And then finally Samuel's like, okay, God, if Saul's not it, then what are we gonna do? How are we gonna lead Israel? And God says, I've got a guy uh, in, a, in, a, in a family and the father of the family's name is Jesse. I want you to go to, to Jesse's house and I want you to, to determine who the person is that I've selected to lead Israel. And in 1 Samuel 16, verse six, it says, so it was that as the boys, Jesse's sons come out, when they came, that Jesse looked at uh, Eliab and he said, surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Samuel, prophet, this man hears from God clearly. And yet in the moment that he sees Eliab, the firstborn, the, the tallest, the, the darkest, the most handsome, the moment he sees him, he thinks because of what he sees with his eyes, surely this is the guy that God's chosen. What do you think Samuel is basing his decision on? It's based on how the guy looks. And God corrects Samuel. Verse seven, the Lord said to him, don't look at his appearance, Samuel, or at his physical stature, because I've refused him. For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Aren't you glad this morning that God hasn't judged you based on how you look on the outside? Amen. Why, because if you look good, you think God's happy. If you're acting good, you think God's happy with your behavior, and if you act bad, then you think, oh man, God ain't so happy with me. If you come in wearing a certain dress, a certain style of clothing, woo, the Lord loves me. And if you wear a different style in different churches, it's like, God don't like them as much. They're wearing, wearing Doc Martens, you know? God, God's not looking at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart. And in our lives, friends, I wanna challenge you. Stop judging people based on what you see temporarily. Amen. When you walk into somebody's story in the middle of the book, you're making the wrong judgment, man, because you don't know what that chapter looks like for them. No, the story of my life is not merely a chapter. It's not merely a page. But if you take a look at my life on any given day, you might think he's got some problems. Like, why is he so upset? Boy, he better fix his temper. Or you walk into someone's chapter and they're coming out of a painful divorce. Don't look at those things because you haven't walked a mile in their shoes. 
God says, I don't look at the outward appearance, but I do look at the heart. See, when God chooses, he, does, he doesn't choose based on the measures that you and I do. God actually uses foolish measures. When God chooses people, when he chooses nations, when he, when he selects callings and anointings, he does it based on what the Bible says is foolish measures. In fact, Paul says it like this in 1 Corinthians 1, in verse number 17. Well, before we, before we actually see that, uh, we know that Paul is writing to a church in the city of Corinth. And this is a messed up church. Like it was a church and they loved God. Like they wanted to do right, but they had all kinds of issues. And so they would write Paul letters and Paul would write them back and he would answer their questions. So as you read his books to the Corinthians, most of the time he's addressing something that they've asked him. In this particular instance, he starts off 1 Corinthians talking about baptism. And so he, all this, this schism has, has arisen. People are saying, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Jesus, or I'm of who, whosoever. And you can already see the early stages of denominations coming about. People saying, I like it the way they do it, a little bit better than the way they do it. And the split was trying to take place. Paul had nothing to do with it. Paul thought, that's way below me. And so people were saying, well, I was baptized by Paul, so I'm of Paul. And I like what Paul said here. He said, Christ didn't send me to baptize. Now, he had already baptized. He's not minimizing the beauty of water baptism. Jesus said it's something you should do. Clearly, water baptism is not dependent. Your salvation is not dependent on water baptism. If it was, Paul's in big trouble because he's leaving people only with the gospel, and then they're going to hell afterwards, right? I'm not sure how water baptism became this requirement, but I feel sorry for you if you're on your way to get baptized and things go wrong because clearly God is unhappy with you because water didn't cover you. No, that's an outward sign of an inward change. Paul said, God didn't send me to baptize. Paul said that, and I love it because it helps me sometimes. You know, as a pastor of a church, there are so many directions I can go. There's so many things I can emphasize on any given Sunday. And when I read this recently, it was as if the Lord said, Brandon, do what I've asked you to do. Preach what I've asked you to preach and not what people expect me to preach. Now, there's nothing wrong with what some people want, but I know that God hadn't called me to do certain things. There's certain places that I'm not ever gonna emphasize and it doesn't make them less than, I'm gonna follow my assignment. Are you guys on board with that? He said, God didn't ask me, Jesus didn't send me to baptize, but here's what he did send me to do, to preach the gospel. Man, that's my passion. I wanna preach the gospel. And the gospel is not just some topic that's meant for the unsaved. The gospel is not just something to try to get people into heaven. We're gonna see, and we know this already, it's much deeper than that. He said, now here's what I'm not gonna say with the gospel. He sent me to preach. There's ways to communicate this gospel, the good news. There's ways to do it. He said, the way I'm not gonna do it is with wisdom of words. I'm not gonna preach the gospel, the good news of what Jesus did with wisdom of words, that is with rhetoric, with flowery language, uh, with, all the, with, all the right, with all the right nuances and all the right emphasis on the, on the right words and picking out the perfect Greek just for the sake of trying to impress people. He says, I don't wanna preach with the wisdom of words, but rather I wanna, uh, because if I do, the cross of Christ would be made of no effect. Do you know you can preach the gospel and it doesn't make a difference in someone's life? You can actually preach what Jesus did, but water it down so immensely that nobody gets anything from it. You're using human words. You're communicating with people what the good news is. But when you start stacking on it the wisdom of words, your ideas, your outlines, your your little clean boxes, sometimes I think we've gotten too cute with the gospel and we've tried to categorize it in such a clean way that we've ruined the massive power that comes with knowing who Jesus really is. Don't ever forget the gospel, what Jesus came to accomplish was full forgiveness for humanity not to make us kinda right with God, but to make us perfectly righteous with an awesome God. When you start trying to put guardrails on the the truth 
of, of this enormous, eternal, powerful word, when you try to clean it up to make it, well, if you're gonna do it now, don't forget you gotta do these three things first and then God's power is available. No, that's the wisdom of words. That's you trying to get fancy and help people when in truth, you can make the cross of Christ of none effect. Someone say, I'm not doing that. I like the way the BBT says it, if you wanna get raw here. Nobody ever experienced life change because of an eloquent speech. Just by giving eloquent speeches, nobody changes because of that. Makes me feel good, but doesn't have an impact on anybody in the crowd. It's the raw, outrageous truth of God's extravagant grace that transforms hearts. I'm talking about raw, I'm talking about like butt naked truth. I'm talking about why are we putting all these fancy clothes on the gospel, trying to make it tight? I'm gonna put some, put some buttons on here so you can understand this a little better. Now you better watch yourself because, because this is good truth, but if you sin, you're not, you've, you've disqualified yourself. Come on, what do you think the gospel's for? It's for somebody that sinned. The good news is to them. <laughs> you're telling them to do something that God said, no, that's why I did it. Don't tell them to not do it. Tell them what I've done for them. It's the, the raw, outrageous truth of what Christ did that he fully paid all of my penalty. Amen. That is outrageous. Amen. We try to get all fancy. Try to make, put, some, put some little argyle socks on the gospel. <laughs> Keep it clean. No, I don't believe it's clean. I believe it was bloody. I believe that Jesus' flesh was, was open and his bones were exposed. I believe there was a crown of thorns in his head and blood dripped down his face. I believe that raw gospel is what people aren't getting fed. They think it's something that's got formaldehyde and Windex. And No, when you clean it up, when you try to put rules, the wisdom of words around it, you rob it of its power. I'm here to, to be a conductor. I'm here to, to remind you every week of what it means for Christ's full sacrifice to take root in your heart. That you're no longer responsible for what Jesus did. He gave everything so that you could rest in the finished work of the cross. Someone say amen. amen. It's the law that, that puts these, these boundaries on us. The, the wisdom of words it can really be seen as a list of rules. And we like rules really well as people. Like rules keep our society safe. It's a good thing. Rules are not bad. But rules are meant to govern people and people. From man to man, that governance is, is what keeps us safe. The wisdom of words doesn't apply when it comes to God to man. Trying to merely explain it in a systematic way can never get close to the absurdity of what Jesus gave us at the cross. The gospel took place on a piece of wood. It took place on a dead tree. Jesus saved the world in the most foolish way that any man would ever have selected. We want strength. We want God to show up and wipe out our enemies. And yet here God shows up and it looks like he's giving up. It looks like he's laying down. Friends, this is the foolishness. This is the weak things that God has selected because it's in these weak things as we saw last week. Paul said, when I am weak, then I've made him strong because my God will never let me down. James said that, and, and Peter said that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The proud is someone that says, I can do this on my own. I don't need God to get me through this. Or, God, I'm gonna work this thing out myself. I'm gonna follow the, the rules when in fact, the humble says, Jesus did it all for me. I don't have to be perfect in order to have the blessing of God in my life. Someone say, I like the sound of that. Like sound of that. Now, verse number 18. For the message of the cross, man, the emphasis the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. The message of the cross. What is the message? Paul's saying what the cross 
speaks. See, I have kind of this background where it seems like the cross got dismissed. And it was like no, nothing in, in church became about the cross. And, 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 and it would almost be made fun of, like the cross isn't where the power is, it's, it's the empty grave. And then, and then we'd emphasize all these things, but the truth was that I was overlooking the most important element of salvation. The message of the cross is what church is about. Not minimizing the cross, maximizing it. The message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. You could say it like this. If the message of the cross is foolishness to you, then you're perishing. What is the message of the cross? That Jesus died to make you perfectly righteous, perfectly holy, and fully redeemed. The message of the cross that Paul preached wherever he went. Paul said, hey, I didn't come to baptize. I came to preach the gospel. I want to say the same thing. We're going to have water baptisms, but let me tell you something. The emphasis of this church is to set people free. Get the lost aware that you don't have to be lost anymore. And that's not just somebody going to hell, friends. That is all of us at any point, any given day. We've all lost our way. You hear the parable of the lost sheep. Jesus talked about it. A sheep, that's a reference to a believer. There's a parable of the lost son, the, the prodigal son. He was not, no less a son because he was lost, right? right? No, we can all lose our way. And when we do, what Paul is saying is the message of the cross, you're not focusing on the message of the cross, that Jesus died to fully forgive us. Amen. Not partly, not until we get it perfectly right. Not until I come to a day I'm gonna stop sinning. I, Jesus, he didn't come to get me from one sin to the next. He came to fully eradicate sin, and not just the sin of a believer, the sins of the whole world. Amen. That's the message of the cross. Wisdom of words is the enemy of Paul. When you tie in all these requirements that I can imagine, then you're limiting the power. Are you, are you finding yourself perishing today? You feel lost? Chances are that we're just getting started talking about who Jesus is enough. It's focusing on what Jesus, the foolishness of God through Christ on the cross. That's what's gonna pull you out of this perishing moment. Someone say, I'm coming out. He says the, the foolishness of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. He says, but the message of the cross, watch this, next part. The message of the cross is the power of God to us who are being saved. Amen. Do you get that? The message of the cross is what? It's the power of God. Where is the power of God, friends? The message of the cross altogether. Where's the power of God? The of the What's the message of the cross? That I am forgiven that I am redeemed, Amen. that I am perfectly holy right now and I haven't done anything to earn it. Amen. Friends, that's outrageous. It, it makes people mad when you take away their need to repent in order to be forgiven. Like it makes people, like religion gets mad when you say stuff like that. But that is clearly the message of the cross. And when you water it down, you make the cross of none effect. When you tell people, you better get rid of that unforgiveness or God can't help you. When you. That's the wisdom of man. That's the wisdom of words. That's you imagining something when in truth, God is already forgiven completely. And I would never want someone to live a life of unforgiveness. That's poison to you. God's not mad at you because you're living in unforgiveness. He, he's hurt because you could experience so much more than that. No, what I want to do is I want to preach the raw goodness of God that he loves you despite you. Amen. It was while you were still sinning that Christ came. Amen. He didn't wait for you to clean up. Okay, finally, they're good enough. No, it was in the depravity of our sin Amen. that God said, now is the time. Now is the perfect moment. Do you wanna see the, do you wanna be saved? Look at this, but to us who are being saved, that's not to us who are saved. It's a, it's a present participle and it's, it's passive. It's happening to us. It's not you saving yourself. To us who are being saved, someone say, I'm being saved today. Saved. That means delivered. That means set free. The power of God is the message of the cross to those who are being saved. To paraphrase it, the BBT, if the message of the cross is the power of God to you, then you are being saved. 
right now where you sit, you might have felt like you were perishing. The reason that you were perishing is because you don't really believe that Jesus did it all. You have questioned in your heart whether he finished all of it or is there still something more for me to do? And that's why in Hebrews, the Bible says, you need to enter rest because it's when you finally rest that Jesus finished the work that we can take life and actually start enjoying it. We're not looking for the toughest truck. We're not looking for the strongest grovelly voice. We're resting and relying on the foolishness of the cross. Amen. It is the power of God. Someone say, that's the power. That's the power. I'm thankful that grace has arrived. And I'm thankful as a church that we get to declare it loudly and boldly. Amen. I know for a fact that grace challenges thinking like radical grace. So sometimes I hear it called hyper grace. I don't really, I don't even like these titles. Like I just want to preach the cross and man's going to label what he's going to label. But the truth is, is that we as humans, we prefer to see people making progress based on the rules. So, so, a, so a law keeper, someone that says, well, you better do it just right. Don't, don't miss it anywhere along the way or else you got to start all over again. Like here's step one, step two, step three. Oh man, you blew it at step three. Okay, back to the beginning. Okay, here we go again. Step one, step two, step, and you didn't quite, quite make three. Back to the beginning. And before you know it, we give up. Because I, I made it almost to step three, and I'm pretty sure step four was, was healing. I'm, I'm pretty sure it was healing. I made it step three, but then I got tired. And, and the guy told me I got to come back here and start over again. And so, okay, I'm going to try it again. And before you know it, you have worn yourself down. A law keeper, someone that believes in that cycle, they look at you and they can easily identify and say, ooh, look at him. He's making progress. That's a guy that knows what he's doing. That's, the, that's how the world judges our progress spiritually. But for, but for grace, a law keeper looks at a grace person and says, well, they ain't even doing anything. They're, that's foolishness. Like, why aren't they doing something? Like, don't you know what you're facing right now? Why are you only resting? Why aren't you worried? Why aren't you scurrying? Why, why isn't every day of your, why aren't you just listening to tapes on healing if you're sick? Just listening to tapes. Look, I'm not against filling yourself with the word. What I'm trying to combat is a mentality that requires that in order for God to do something. I believe in the power of the spoken word, the written word, but don't put it in front of what God has already done. He's already done it all. A hundred percent that's required for me to enjoy this life. It was found at the cross, friends. That's the message of the cross. That's why when Paul would speak, <laughs> he talked in Leicester. I mentioned this a few weeks ago. And this crippled man from birth listened to Paul day in and day out. Paul was preaching the gospel, according to Acts. Well, 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 and this man had faith to be healed. What do you suspect? If he had faith to be healed, and all we know, as Paul's preaching the gospel, what do you think the gospel message is? That you don't gotta be sick anymore. Amen. Paul had to be preaching it. That, I mean, the man couldn't have had faith if he wasn't hearing that that's what God wanted them to happen. And yet this man didn't go to Bible college. He didn't fly off to some city trying to get somebody to pray for him. He took God at his word. Amen. I'm so thankful to know that my God loves me ridiculously right where I am right now. Someone say, that is foolish, preacher. Well, I'm glad you said that. Because in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, a little further down, verse 26, Paul said, brothers and sisters, think, not, uh, think of what you were when you were called. He says, not many of you were wise by human standards. How many of you can relate to that? Not many. He's being generous, by the way. Not many, not any. Uh, were influential and not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And he chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. Friend, if you feel foolish and you feel weak, you are perfectly qualified to be called of God. God doesn't call the strong by their own estimation. He doesn't call the one that's wealthy by their own estimation. He calls the one that knows I can't do this without him. 
Verse 28, God chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things, the things that are not, to nullify the things that are. Why? So that no one, someone say no one, that is no flesh may boast before him. Friends, you cannot, God has taken away, he has stripped you of every right to brag about how you got something. That's why I don't wanna write any books about how I got something or, or, or I have 17 ways I got healed. Because as soon as I list my 17, guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna write them down. Woo, okay, I'm gonna do that. And then I'm gonna do that one. Oh, okay, I'm gonna do that one. Here's the problem is you're gonna find another book on amazon.com. And it's got 20 ways they got healed and they're different from mine. And so now you got 17 plus 20. Now you got 37 ways for you to get healed. But there's another book. And there's another book. And there's another book. If you're trying to get something that's already given to you, you will always be frustrated. If you're, try, if you're struggling to get something that's already your promise, you'll come out weak every time. That's the wisdom of words. Paul said, I can't preach the gospel that way because it waters down the gospel. It makes the cross of no effect. It makes the stripes of Jesus, by his stripes I'm healed. It makes it of no effect when I put conditions on that. Amen. Straighten up or else you can't get it. It's of no effect, because guess what? I might straighten that one thing out that you can see, but you don't know the 15 things you didn't mention. You're just telling me what you can see, but I got a whole bunch of hidden stuff that you can't even get to yet. And so now I take care of that one thing. Why am I not getting it? Well, because you just put me under the law. You just put the rules in place. And now the power of the cross is not effective. Friends, I'm talking about in this church, we're about to see a breakout of miracles because we ain't looking to some man's wisdom. We are looking to the cross. Are you ready for breakthrough in your life? How many of you are hungry for something bigger? Come on, you've been in church your whole life and you've been like, well, it's supposed to work. How come it ain't working yet? It's about to work right now. Because we are stripping away, we're stripping one, one layer at a time. We're stripping away your right to take credit. If any man boasts, let him boast in the Lord, not in what you did to earn from him. Someone say amen. amen. Verse 30. It's because of him, because of God, that you were in Christ. It's because of him. You didn't do it. Well, I got saved. You know, I chose Christ. No, God chose you. You don't even get credit for that part. Who has become for us, now watch this, who has become for us wisdom. Who has become for us wisdom? Jesus. Jesus has become wisdom. What did Paul start off saying in verse 17? He says, I don't preach with the wisdom of words. There's another wisdom that he does preach with. And it's the wisdom of Christ. Jesus has become our wisdom now. And watch what wisdom is. That is righteousness. You lack wisdom in life, guess what you ought to be professing? That I am right before God. I am right and I'm in right standing with him. Wisdom from Christ is you are holy. That's wisdom. Holiness. It's not wisdom to call yourself a sinner. It's not wisdom to call yourself an idiot. That's not wisdom. That's the wisdom of words maybe your experience, maybe what you saw, but the reality of your heart when you accept Christ. And what does God look at? Not at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. When Christ moves in, when he takes up residence, when you take the step of acknowledging the finished work of the cross, now you've got the wisdom of Christ on the inside of you. And that wisdom reminds you that I'm righteous, I'm holy, and I am fully redeemed. Someone say, I'm righteous, I'm holy, and I am redeemed. That's the wisdom of God. Going back to verse number 17 again, back up a couple of verses. Nobody ever experienced, or for Christ did not send me to preach the, uh, to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with the wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ be made of no effect. Now let's compare that. Remember, wisdom of words with what we just read in verse 30. Pull verse 30 up again for me. You are in Christ who has become for us wisdom from God. Friends, where are you right now? Someone say, I'm in Christ. And where is Christ right now? Someone say, he's in me. The wisdom of God now resides perfectly and wholly on the inside of you. The wisdom of words resides in your head and it resides between your ears. 
The wisdom of words tries to, to define and categorize the blessing of the Lord by what you do. The wisdom of Christ says, I am fully justified because of nothing that I did and everything that Christ did for me. If you want to receive wisdom, in other words, you ought to be preaching what Christ did. Amen. The emphasis of your life every day ought to be, I'm going to do what Jesus said I can do. Jesus bought healing for me at the cross and I receive healing into my body. Amen. When you wake up in the morning, you ought not be quoting how good you're going to be that day. Lord, I'm going to obey you perfectly today. No, you ain't. You ain't even gonna get close. I'm gonna do everything just right today, God, because I love you so much. No, that's the wrong emphasis. No, you ought to wake up and say, God, thank you for what you did on the cross through your son. Jesus, thank you that you gave everything for me. That is wisdom. See, James said, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all men liberally. He gives more than enough wisdom and it'll be given to him. When you talk about Jesus, that wisdom rises up on the inside. If you lack wisdom today, you've got a choice to make. If you've, got, if you've got a big decision, you have no idea what to do. I had a decision like that a few years ago. I was in a, a position in, in my job and I, I faced my employer and I was forced in a moment to resign from my position. And I remember in this moment, probably the most vulnerable moment of my entirety, at that moment, I cried out to God. <laughs> I said, God, in my heart, I, God, I don't know what to do. Lord, I have no idea what the right decision is right now. And you know what happened? I heard a voice from heaven. No, I didn't hear anything, actually. It sounds really spiritual to say I heard God. But the truth is, I heard nothing. It was quiet. And I, don't, I, I mean, I don't have like a 10 minutes to make this choice. I mean, my family's on the line, my career, it's on the line and I've got to make a decision right then. And I, I told my wife later, I was like, I'm thinking, you know, what would, what would 007 do right now? <laughs> like if I, was, if I was Jason Bourne, what would I do right in this moment? I looked at the window, I thought I'd go crashing out the window. I don't know, I'm, I don't know exactly what to do. I heard nothing. Here's my point. Because I know what Jesus accomplished on the cross for me, I just receive wisdom. And that wisdom may not say, hey, blinking red, green light, here's what you do, Brandon. But I trust that the decision I do make, God's gonna get my back. I'm not holding off on making a decision because what if I blow it? No, I focus my life on Jesus and the completed work on the cross. And I don't worry what happens after I make the choice. I'm not worried about it. My God has got my back. And can I tell you that because of the choice I made in that moment with no sound whatsoever, this church is here today. Because of that decision, because in that moment of complete vulnerability, no idea what to do, a church stands and gets to proclaim something very unique and very special. Don't worry about what you hear from God. Think on Christ. The wisdom of words says, you ought to be able to you know, ask for a sign. Like, 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 give me a sign, God. Like, if, if my phone rings in the next three minutes, then I'm gonna make this choice. Friends, the devil about to call you. <laughs> oh, or if, if you don't get the call, you like extend it. It's like overtime. Okay, God, 30 minutes now. A phone call in 30 minutes, I'm gonna make this choice. No, make a choice, but look at Christ. Make a decision while you're looking at Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. Why? Because Jesus has become for us wisdom. Amen. Not your schooling, not your education, not your experience. Christ is now the wisdom of God. That is the power of God, and it's the message of the cross. Someone say, it's Jesus. Paul said in Colossians 2, 3, he said, in Jesus are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. In Jesus are hidden all the treasures. Are you in Jesus right now? Amen. Yes, you are. Yes, you are, you little sweet Christian. <laughs> you, <laughs> you are in Jesus right now. And he's on the inside of you. So let me ask you, do you have wisdom? Someone say yes. yes. Do you have all the wisdom of heaven? Yes. 
Yes. Yeah, but I don't know it. <laughs> it's because it's in you. It's because it's hidden. What's your job to receive wisdom? It's to rest, Amen. not try to figure it all out <laughs> because you can't. And all your friends can give you their best advice and maybe it's good advice. I mean, there's wisdom in a multitude of counsel. That's, that's a good thing. But the answer doesn't come from everybody else. The answer comes from resting in what Jesus did on the cross. You want to experience the full power of the cross? Then look only at Jesus. And as you do, as you look at Jesus, your prayer life will be elevated. You won't go pray because I've got to pray or else. You won't go pray because, uh-oh, I didn't get my 30 minutes in today. No, that's the wrong motivation. You'll go pray because I can't wait to be with this outrageous lover in my life. I just need to tell you how thankful I am today for what you did for me, God. Amen. You won't give financially because you have to or else. You'll give because he gave everything and I can't wait to take a piece of me and say, God, I've got to give this back to you. Your motivation changes. And I'm telling you something, the experience of your life will follow. You'll begin to see the things you've desired, but it's not because you chased after them perfectly, it's because you rested that Jesus has already made them available. Someone say, they're already mine. They're already mine. Friends, wisdom comes as we rest in Christ. Looking through the filter of the cross, in other words, is everything to receiving from God. You've got to look through the filter of the cross. Don't look through your behavior. That's the wrong, that's the wrong motivation. That's the Old Testament. So whenever we read through the Old Covenant, you, you ought to read the Old Testament. Beautiful, symbolic pictures of Christ. Like I, I love the stories of the Old Covenant. But make sure you put the filter of cross on that. You put the finished work of Christ on what you read. Don't just read it for what it is, because if you do, you will fall back into, uh-oh, I'm, I'm way short of that standard. Remember the old covenant standard? It was perfect. It was self-righteousness. We see an example of this in Joshua chapter one, a beautiful scripture. You've probably heard this many times. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then, okay, there's that if then. If you do this, then that'll happen. Well, we know better. We know according to the cross of Christ, he did it already. It's already completed. So there ain't no if then. On the other hand, we ought to enjoy what Christ has made available to us. And so the reality is, is that's not a condition for me to receive, but it is a reminder that I should enjoy meditating on the word of God. Enjoy it. That word meditate, it literally means to mutter, to mumble under your breath. You ought to talk about the finished work of the cross all the time. Every time you get in a position of either victory or defeat, you ought to just be thankful. Woo, I thank God Jesus won on the cross. Amen. It was on the cross. I was made righteous and blameless. And I know my God is working this thing out for me, not because I'm perfect or I know everything, but because Jesus lives in me. And if he's in me, then I'm full of the wisdom of God. Just mutter those things. Just all the time, speak it under your breath. In the, in the conference room, everybody else is depressed and upset and you smiling. <laughs> don't you know layoffs are coming, you idiot? Well, I don't care if layoffs are coming. Jesus finished the work on the cross. Amen. My God shall supply all my need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. There's rest always. Oh, but I wrecked my car the other day. And don't you know the, the pain I've got to go through now to, to get all that fixed? Well, I know that, but don't you know that Jesus died on the cross so he can make a way through this trial? He's going to keep me strong in the midst of it. I've got the wisdom of God. He said, meditate on these things. For then, this is what we know we have now. Not because you meditate perfectly, but this is the blessing promised to us. Someone say, now. I will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Friends, because of the cross, God says, I will make your way prosperous. Now, what's interesting about these two words, prosperous and success, in the Hebrew language, it's the Hebrew word sakal, S-A-K-A-L, which actually means wisdom that propels you into success. Do you hear what the Lord's telling you today? 
the wisdom of Jesus of Christ because of what he did on the cross, when you emphasize that, when you lead your life with not, I prayed, I fasted, so I need to be healed. No, when you lead with Christ died for me, he perfected me, I'm in right standing with God. That's the wisdom of God speaking through you. And it's those words, it's that expectation that propels you into success. What's your business? Just whatever, what are you doing to, to, to make money right now? When you get to work tomorrow morning, or if you go this afternoon or this evening, I want you to imagine that not because you said every confession just right, but because of the cross, where's the power of God? The message of the cross. What now is the wisdom of God? It's Christ in me. And what does that wisdom bring? It propels me into success. Friends, God's plan is for you to succeed greatly. If you're in sales, you ought to be declaring, my God is propelling me into success today. In your own marriage, you ought to be declaring, because of the cross of Christ, because of what Jesus did, I am a strong husband. I love my wife perfectly, not because I know how, but because I've got Jesus in me. And it's because I'm in him and he's in me that I have wisdom to do this. I'm being propelled to success. Your eyes ought to be fixed on God's propulsion system. The system of God's propulsion says, you just need to rest and let what Jesus did take you there. Where's the lack in your life? You're being propelled today. Where's the hurt in your heart? God's propelling you past it today. Where's the disappointment in your career? God says today, stop looking at you. Look perfectly to the cross and you will experience that success that you have always dreamed was yours. Inherently, we all know we ought to succeed. Here's the beauty of this message is this isn't for Americans. Like some people say, well, it's easy for you to say that because you have this great system, this economic system where you can go, no, this isn't just for Americans. Take this message anywhere and declare to them, your expectation needs to be raised. Get your eyes off of you and what you think God is interested in. God doesn't care about all your outward stuff. He cares about what's in your heart. <laughs> and that's why we have the true wisdom of God. The power of God is the message of the cross. That is it. That is the power of God. Are you hearing me this morning? Yeah. Am I helping anybody in this section over here? Yeah. Did I help you today? Yeah. You guys in the middle, did I help anybody today? Over here, have you been helped? Someone say, my help. My help. It comes from God. Not from man. Not from man. Hallelujah. If you believe it, someone say amen.